I think it's time we take a cold drink. Let's chill for a second under the learning tree. Remind us again. Get us get us set up for the question once again, Ron. Well, this learning tree question comes from another podcast, oddly enough. It's called the, the Post Rhetoric Podcast. And they ask in this question, how do you recall all these 45-year-old shows in such detail? And that's a great question. And it's one I've been asked a few times before. It's a long time. 45 years is a long time. And I'm going to start from, from where it really starts with me and, uh, and why I have this ability to do it. It all begins with the fact that I'm a third generation wrestler and a booker and an owner, of several different wrestling companies. And I grew up in the wrestling business. I started watching wrestling matches when I was three years old and, uh, and remembering so many things from those matches. So I've always, since I was a little boy, been able to remember pretty much most anything that I saw concerning wrestling. You know, it's like, wow, it's like it just sticks in my memory bank, you know, and I know exactly when all of this started. And it started in the year 1958, and I was 10 years old, and I went to see my father wrestle Mario Galento in Ladd Stadium in Mobile, Alabama. Wow. Everything about that night stuck in my mind, and I decided that night that that's what I wanted to do when I grew up, and I wanted to become a wrestler. So I saw one of the largest crowds in the Southern wrestling history, estimated at 40,000, show up in this football stadium in Mobile, Alabama. Wow. And I remember my mom walking, my brother and I, I'm 10, Rob was nine. She walked us across the football field to the opposite side of the, the football field where the other grandstand was. And we walked about halfway up to the top of that grandstand. And I remember when I turned around and I saw that mass of humanity there to see my father. It affected me the rest of my life. It was wow. like a, it was a moment that I will never forget. Well, then we, when we bent back across that field and we, we had to stand behind the thousands of people that the one side of that stadium, uh, it held uh, probably 35,000 people, I would say. It was totally sold out. So a lot of those fans had come down on the field itself, and there was a, probably 3,000 ringside seats on that field. And we were way in the back there. Could barely see anything of what was happening, except I got these occasional views of my dad and Mario Glento, and they were covered in blood. I mean, wow, I'd never seen bleeding like that. Uh, so much blood that, that few people even stayed. The, the first people in the first three rows, there was blood flying into the first three rows, and people got up and left those first three rows because. They couldn't take it. I wow. mean, it was, it was it was horrible. And I wouldn't find out for years, Dave, that in that match, every punch they threw was a hard way. And I remember my father had a broken nose. He had two black eyes. And uh, they were still shut closed two weeks after the match. I remember that uh, Mario Glento had 75 stitches in his face alone. God. You know, from this match, you know. So I remember my mother had to drive my dad everywhere because he couldn't see for two weeks. I also remember the first time that he tried to open one of his eyes, and I caught him in the bathroom, and me and Rob were just happened to walk by, and he was he reached up and he opened, he pulled his eye apart to see. I don't know what 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 his eyeball looked like. I guess. And when he did, blood squirted out of his eye under the mirror. Good God. Two weeks after this match. So wow. many people, you know, ask me when I tell this story, uh, how I watched this match and the results of it two weeks later. And uh, they ask me, weren't you traumatized? I mean, did, how did that affect you? I mean, how, how did you deal with that as a 10-year-old? And, you know, I think it was because of the sport. The sport of wrestling was in my blood. I was destined to be a wrestler. And I realized that at 10 years old, that this is what I wanted to do. So to put this life-changing event in perspective, uh, this match occurred 30 years before the biggest wrestling company in the world today ever, uh, you know, uh, had their first WrestleMania. 
Don't need to mention the name. Everybody knows who I'm talking about, okay? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mobile, Alabama had a population of less than 200,000. 40,000 of them show up at the stadium, which meant one out of five people living in that city was wow. at that match. Are you kidding? Well, you know, I mean, run the numbers. I mean, you know, they might not have all been from Mobile, but there was uh, a yeah. great deal of people from that. So I'm going to give fans out there that say WrestleMania and WWE is the biggest thing that ever happened. I want to give you a fact here, okay? Nine WrestleManias have averaged the figure for nine WrestleManias with 17,114 fans per event. Hmm. That meant that less than half as many was in these WrestleMania events that was in that one city of Alabama in 1958. Holy cow, yeah. So let's jump back now to the question itself from this learning tree and was how do I recall all these 45-year-old shows in such detail? Well, I, I think I was really born with an innate ability to remember practically everything that I saw that had to do with wrestling, especially when it came to my own companies. I remember lots of things uh, in watching Georgia wrestling and companies that weren't mine when I was a kid. And I could tell you the finishes. I could tell you the ends of matches. You know, so my own companies, it was even easier for me. So if you were a booker in a territory, especially one where you had been in for years, you absolutely had to be able to recall every angle and every show, or you were going to repeat those angles again, which you couldn't do as a booker. That's a critical mistake as a booker if you're going to do the same angle again and again and again. A great booker is going to remember everything he ever did, and he's going to remember the finishes and the angles. So for a booker recalling everything, it's just part of the job. So actually, on top of the fact that that's the way it is, I actually have some help beyond just my memory. I got a friend out of Atlanta that Brian Lass introduced me to that sent me every card for Knoxville from the day Southeastern Wrestling had its first match to the day it closed. And on top of that, I have the actual TV formats from every show from the beginning of Southeastern all the way to the end of it. So I believe with all that support, and I'm very accurate about events and angles and everything I cover, I also am ready for the future because I got Bo James, who's a Southern Wrestling historian, who's already compiling the cards for Southeastern Pensacola once I hit 1978. And I have all of the television formats for all those years from 78 to 88 as well. So uh, I appreciate your question, guys. I can understand your reason for questioning it, but I, I take pride in what I do. And probably few other people could accomplish what I do. No, you know, no. I thank you guys at the Post Rhetoric Podcast for your support and for your question. You know, that that makes a lot of sense because I thought, does Ron keep a personal diary of everything that freaking happened on all these shows? That's an amazing job in and of itself. 